God never took a day off with our lives. He is always there, always the same, ever present, always working in our lives. And is even the Bible says there's a scripture, I think it's in Proverbs, it says he loads us with his benefits daily. In other words, he's, he's blessing us whether we know it or not. And that's an awesome thing. But you know, as time goes on, things happen and we kind of forget about them. I bet, raise your hand if you can think of something God's done in your life. Isn't that an awesome thing? I can, I can think of so many miraculous things that God has done in my life, but you know I don't always think of them. What about when you have trouble today? Do you remember His blessings of the past? Or do you kind of forget about them? Isn't that true? Forget. We tend to forget, that's right. If you were all elephants, you would never forget, because you said an elephant never forgets. An elephant never forgets, or your wife if you do something wrong. No. <laughs> i got to remember Robin's here, not in Children's Church, so i got to watch myself. But you know, we tend to forget. We forget what God has done in our lives. We come into the kingdom saying, look what the Lord has done. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away, and all things have become new. But then after 10 years, after 15 years, after 20 years maybe, or maybe just after two years, we forget what God did. We forget that He saved us just in time. Let me pose you a question here this morning. What if God had held off on your salvation for five years? Where would you be? Where would you be? You know, there are people that I know that I, I'd be willing to, to sit down and ask the Lord, God, if you hadn't saved them just in time, would they still be living? A lot of times when He saves us, He saves our lives. There'd be marriages broke up, there'd be people lost, there'd be people hurt, injured, there'd be tragedy. Instead of having lives of blessings, they'd have lives of, of turmoil, but turn and tell your neighbor, God saved you just in time. Hallelujah. And you know, you say, well, if you're not saved, today is the day of salvation. Amen? Until Jesus comes back, we're in the grace period. That's right. It means that if any man calls upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. Hallelujah. But you know... And this series is on revival, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. I think that the longer believers know the Lord, the less urgency we feel to witness. Everybody comes in on fire for the Lord, but a lot of times the fire dies down. Anybody have a wood stove at home? Burn wood. Anybody ever burn wood? Eat their house. Yeah. I learned something right away with the wood stove. If you don't stoke the fire and put wood in it, it goes out. Right. Yep. Yeah. And it won't put the logs in itself. Unfortunately. It won't light itself. We had a wood stove. And it was down in the basement and it, it worked pretty good. We fired up and it would it would heat enough of the house up. It was well insulated the house. That it would go all night. But you'd have to get up in the morning and put wood in it because the, the temperature would tell you it's starting to get cool now. You know? A wood stove will go all night if it's a good stove, but you gotta stoke it and put wood in. But what about our lives? How long? Will the fire of God burn in us if we don't stoke that fire? Think about it. You know, there are some exceptions. I had a, uh, a little note at Christmas time from a uh, blessed couple. Tom and Margie, I won't use their last name, but they're great people of God. They were instrumental in leading me to the Lord way back when. And that was a long time ago. I think they're both in their 80s, wouldn't you say, huh? Yeah, in their 80s. And they're still serving the Lord. They're doing, uh, they're both doing, I know, the husband and wife, they do it separately, but they're both doing prison or jail ministry. 
they go in, and I know uh, Tom goes in and he shows movies on hunting and fishing and hunting for moose up in Canada and all kinds of stuff, and all the prisoners come out and then he shares the gospel. He was doing that for a while. And I know his wife Margie goes into the ladies' prison and she shares and witnesses. She goes to four different ones, she said. That's awesome. 80 years old and still going strong for the Lord. Still witnessing, still out there working. But that's more the exception than the rule. Because, and I'm sure both of them, they have a, a, a calling of the evangelist. I'm sure both of them are still just as evangelistic as they ever were. But we tend to be less evangelistic as time goes on. Isn't that true? As a matter of fact, it's the new born again Christians that bring most people into the Lord on a regular basis. They're the ones that are reaching out to their friends, their family, you know. It's tough for me because I'm the paid professional, or especially me and Robin, her whole family's gotten saved now. They weren't all saved back when, but they've gotten saved. We laid their names on an altar and prayed over them. And you know, the devil was trying to get them, but God wouldn't let them go. Let me tell you something. When you lift somebody up in prayer and pray for them, God moves. And He draws them. Amen. That's the reason I'm here. I got on one of her sister's prayer lists way back when. Couldn't get off it. She kept praying and praying and praying. And God pulled me through. He saved me just in time. But people are excited when they're first saved to say, look what the Lord has done to show. You know, and as we get older, we get a little quieter, we get a little more reserved. It's just human nature. You know, you're excited when something's new, but then it kind of passes. It's just like somebody comes in and says, praise God, I was healed. Anybody been healed by the laying out of hands or God healing something? I've, I've seen it. I've experienced it. But you know, then later on, we kind of forget about it. And the fire in us starts to die down and starts to flicker. You know, think about when people are first saved. I remember myself, I was at every service there was. Every teaching, I drove for miles. Robin can testify to that. Burn up tons and tons of gas. And then as you get older, it might be more hit and miss. Yep. I remember a time way back when, and I was healthier then too. And it wasn't, it was, well, in here too. I sat down and said, it's seven days a week, seven nights a week I have ministry someplace. Every day, every day, going every day. Now please don't try to go every day and do stuff every, I mean, you'll burn yourself out. I'm not saying that. But we have to understand something about the fire of the Lord. It won't stoke itself. Amen? Right. You have to stir up the fire that's in you. Now, I don't know if this is true or not. I quit following some of the stuff, but back 20 years ago, and it was, what, 21 years ago that we started Greater Victory Fellowship. That's a long time. 21 years in October. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Started, where was the first service? I'm trying to remember. Was it in church office? No, I think we had it in our house. We had it in our living room. Amen. The kids were still late for church. No. We had it in our living room. Yep. Yeah, they like that. They just get up and look down the hall and church. that a couple of times and then it was Jerry's insurance office. Well, way back when revival, even maybe 25 years ago, revival was the big term. And people were going all over to go to revivals. You know, at this church or that church or this meeting or that meeting. Now, I don't know if anybody's been, or anybody been ever up to the Toronto deal up there. The, well, I forget what it's called. Toronto Blessing or something. I went Airport Fellowship in Toronto. I went up there one time for a visit. And uh, that was kind of neat. And the Brownsville Revival, yep, I went down there too. Um, but you know, revival is not evangelism. Revivals lead to great evangelism. 
Evangelism is kind of born out of revival. Evangelism, of course, is reaching the lost for Jesus. But revival takes place when the Holy Spirit fire in believers is kindled. And what happens when you get your fire kindled, it starts an evangelistic revival. Because all of a sudden, people are saying, look what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. And they've got a fire burning in them. And folks, God gave me kind of a picture of this. We live in a, a dark and sinful world. Amen? That's right. If you're out in the woods someplace and it's completely dark and you start a fire, if there's somebody else out in the woods, guess what? They're going to see that <laughs> fire and they're going to come to you because it's the only light around. That's right. I know on the Australian outback, the first thing they do, they sit down and they build a little fire. Even if they don't need to cook anything and they don't need the heat, it just tells other people that they're there. It announces their presence. Folks, the, the light in the darkness draws people. But you don't get light in the darkness, turn and tell your neighbor, without building a fire. Hallelujah. Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, stir up the fires of revival in your heart, Timothy. Timothy was a pastor. And in 2 Timothy 1.5, he said, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, I am persuaded is also in you. And Paul's saying, he points out, he's saying, Timothy, you're, you're a man of faith. You've got a, a lineage of faith. From your, from your mother and your, your grandmother were great women of faith, and you're, you're a man of faith as well. He points that out. <clears throat> and he reminds Timothy that he should not only be a man of faith, but he needs to be walking by faith. Now, Timothy was a pastor, yet, folks, it doesn't matter who you are, or what your calling is in the church, everybody needs to stir that fire up. Amen? Amen. 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 Paul goes on to say, Therefore I remind you, stir up the gift of God which is in you to the laying on of my hands. Paul tells Timothy to stir up the gift. What is he talking about? Well, at some point in time, evidently, Paul laid hands on Timothy and prayed, and he received probably the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he received some spiritual gifts. Does everybody know what spiritual gifts are? Amen? Amen. Prophecy, healing, there are gifts of healing. Hallelujah. There's, there's gifts of the Spirit that we have. Wisdom, knowledge. We don't know what Timothy's giftings were, except he was a pastor, and, and Paul was saying, Timothy, you've got gifts. But stir them up. How do you stir up the gifts? Well, how do you stir up the fire? Who's familiar with getting the fire re going in the wood stove? Anybody familiar with that? You stick your hand in there and go like this in the no. You take a poker, right? You poke it around. What do you have to do? You have to get a little air to those coals. The coals are there. But you got to get a little air to those coals. You got to poke it around a little bit. Amen. And then you got to put some fuel on the fire. You got the heat. You got a little bit of air going in there. You stir it up. I'm amazed at how long coals will remain hot and buried in a fire. It's a long. Anybody ever dealt with that? It's a long time. That fire can be out for maybe a day sometimes. you still got a whole bunch of coals there that you can stir up. That's right. You know, I don't care who you are and how the fire is in you now, but if you get with God and you start poking those coals and stirring them up and letting the Lord breathe on them, get a little air on those, folks, you're never so far out that God can't stir up the fire. Right. Amen? Amen? He's telling Timothy, stir up the fire, stir up the gifts that are in you. What's Timothy supposed to do? Well, pray, worship, get before the Lord, 
exercise the gifts, go start praying for folks. And he tells Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 7, I like how all these verses kind of tie together. He says, For God has not given us, Timothy, a spirit of fear, of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind. Power, love, and a sound mind. Huh. Now, when Timothy was a pastor, it was a time of crushing persecution in the church. It was not like today. I don't, nobody's going to come in and arrest us and drag us off today. Although if they did, it would probably help the church to grow and stir it up. As soon as you try to tell people what not to do, they start to want to do it. Amen? But he's telling Timothy, don't be afraid. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Do you know, the longer somebody is a Christian, the more hesitant they are about witnessing. Isn't that true? What will my neighbors think? What will they think? Will they, will, they, will they shoot me down? Will they reject me? Rejection is a hard thing. He says, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. We get a canvas of, of this general area. It was like a 10-mile circle, I think, um, around our old church building in Sandy Creek. And we sent the people out two by two. You know why you send people out two by two? Because if you send them out one by one, they won't go. It's kind of nerve-wracking to knock on doors. And some people were friendly, some weren't. You know? But one thing I learned that shocked me, I went out with another pastor. And the two of us went out. And aside from almost being dog food for a couple large animals, uh, we didn't have too many. And it was an ice storm that day, too, or that weekend. So we were fighting that. But I came to the general conclusion that 80% plus, maybe 85% of the people in this area don't go to church any place. They don't go to church at all. It's not that you have people going to one church. They may have gone to a denominational church. Maybe uh, somebody got married or they go Christmas once a year. Maybe on Easter. But they're not churchgoers. That's right. And a lot of them didn't even have a church. Weren't looking. Church was not part of their lives. And folks, we're living in a day and age today that things have changed. In the last five to ten years, this world has changed completely. Let me give you an example. Take school sports. I remember back when I was a kid that to get on any kind of a team was a tough thing in school because everybody tried to go out. They had, so, they had to cut all kinds of people for basketball, for football, for all the different things. Well, guess what? This, right now, they can't get enough kids to even show up. They don't want to play. They have no interest. They're doing this. Tablets. Our phones. Their phones, their tablets, their internet. Yeah? And they have no interest. It's even saying that some of the smaller kids are falling out of school at their desks. Not on purpose. They just fall out. Because they have no core strength. Because they don't go outside and play. They spend all their time either on video games or television or tablets or phones or one of those things. It's, it's amazing. But it's affected the church too. People aren't doing what they used to do. It's a whole different thing. But the church that is saved can't have a spirit of fear. He's telling Timothy you can't be afraid. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Whenever you go to share Jesus... Let me tell you something. Jesus is with you. Amen. The Bible said they went working miracles every place, and it says, and Jesus went with them. That was after he ascended to heaven. Amen. Was he in the flesh walking with them? No. But let me tell you what, folks. We have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Amen. You can't go any place without Jesus going with you and in you. Amen. And when you go to speak, the Holy Spirit is right there. You may not know a scripture, but the Holy Spirit knows them all, and He can bring them back to remembrance. And folks, 
Scriptures are okay, but there's nothing as powerful as look what the Lord has done in, in my life when you share that with somebody. He says in 2 Timothy 1.8, Paul tells Timothy, Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor be his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Hallelujah. Timothy must have gotten a little gun shy about sharing the gospel. When Paul tells Timothy to be bold and don't be ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is, as Paul says, the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. He reminds Timothy that his salvation and holy calling are by the grace of God. It says, what according to his own purpose and grace was given to us by Christ Jesus. He called us and he saved us and called us with a holy calling, 2 Timothy 1 9. <laughs> Not according to works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. When Jesus calls somebody, He calls you because He loves you. Amen. And He wants you to be in fellowship with Him. But He knows who you are. He knows where you live. He knows the people you know that may not know Him. And he wants a fire in you that they can see in this dark world and come in from the darkness and find the light of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. And it's not how special you are or we are. It's how special Jesus is. Amen. He calls us according to his purpose. Amen. Every single solitary Christian believer is called according to God's purpose. It's his plan and his purpose and you are where you are in life because God puts you there for a reason. That's that right. He can work through you. There are people you can pray for that I'll never see or never know. Mm -hmm. There are people you could share with that would never listen to me or somebody else. There are people that you can touch that God wants you to be His hands and His arms and His voice. It's an awesome, awesome thing. Just think where you live. Yeah. You live in an apartment building. You got apartments all over the place. I know we got some in apartments that were in apartments, but you got people in every door. What happens if you start praying for your neighbors? Power of God moves. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Timothy needed a reminder to stir up the gifts in him. And folks, we all do. Human nature hasn't changed. Revival is the stirring up or rekindling of the fire of the Holy Spirit in the heart of a believer. Folks, you can't revive what isn't there yet. Amen? That's right. You can't revive the... the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in, in someone who doesn't have it yet. Revival's not for the lost, it's for the saved. But when you revive the saved, they reach out to the lost. Large-scale revivals happen when it is not only individuals, but groups of believers who catch the fire for the Lord. And I've heard of some in colleges where groups of kids started praying and revival struck the whole area. And you know, here's what happens in revival. You get a group of people that the Holy Spirit is burning, and we don't see the light, we don't see the fire burning, but all of a sudden people who don't know the Lord feel the draw and call of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Yeah, was it the great Welch revival? When in a certain hour, people just started coming to the church from all over the place. They didn't have the kind of phones and telephones and communication. They all didn't get a text message. But the Holy Spirit, according to the prayers of the saints in revival, sometimes it only takes one, folks, to break through. He started drawing people from all over the place. One of the Latter-day revivals that I went to, um, and I was also to Toronto, so I shouldn't say, but I went to Pensacola, Florida for a week 
to the Brownsville Revival for a large pastor's conference. And uh, I went and heard a lot of sermons. I saw the buses that would come in and the crowds of people. People came and stood all day. I don't know if anybody here, was anybody ever at Brownsville? No, went to it? And I'm not saying go chase after revival because I went to Brownsville. There was nothing I experienced at Brownsville that I hadn't experienced firsthand in church. Yeah. I'd seen the miracles and healings and deliverance and all kinds and even prayed for those things. I was completely familiar. What I was not familiar with was the fire, the move of the Holy Spirit that had lines of people from the building around the block, out of sight. They went out for literally miles, lines of people, there at 6 and 5 in the morning waiting for a 7 p.m. service to go to church. Oh my goodness. We're lucky we get people in for 10 o'clock at 10 o'clock. They were there hours ahead of time. And the funny part was, they weren't believers. A lot of them had never been to a church in their lives. They never darkened the door of a church. It's not even like some of them had a church background. They had people, and people did come from all over the world, too. And that's, that's a fact, especially during the pastor's conference. But the sanctuary sat 2,400 people, I believe. And you were touched by a miracle if you got into there to sit out normally. They had overflows in tents and places. They had the thing going out on, on video. And people would stand in the hot sun. Then industrious people started renting chairs and umbrellas because people were standing there. And they wouldn't. I mean, I stood in line there too. You know, time didn't drag. You could feel the Spirit of God out there. You got, st we stood there half the day in line. We had badges on. And the senior pastor of the church was John Kilpatrick. And he's still preaching, I believe. He's not there. He's moved. But he's, he was there for a long, long time. That re revival went on day after day after day after day without a break. Seven days a week. Week after week, month after month, year after year, they just kept coming and coming. Thousands and thousands and millions of people basically came to the place. And Kilpatrick shared with the pastors when I was there, he said, you know, he said, I knew revival broke out here when all of a sudden, and I'm going to use the term that he used, he said, the scum of the earth started showing up here. This is Pensacola, Florida. Pensacola, Florida is a nice place, but it's a city. There's a, there's a lot of stuff. There's drugs and prostitution and gangs and all that kind of stuff was there. And they all started showing up to church. Hallelujah. You got gangbangers standing in line waiting to go to church and you'd ask them, why are you there? They say, I don't know. I have no idea. I just had to come. I had to be there. Hallelujah. Which was kind of a, you had, you had people, cab drivers, this was a funny story, a cab driver had somebody get in the cab and they were from out of town. They knew nothing about church and revivals. They were there to have fun. And not the kind of fun that you'd want to talk about if you were a churchgoer. They were there for drinking and carousing. They said, where is it at in Pensacola? Drop us off where it's at. He says, the hottest thing in town is right here. And he dropped them off in line for the church. They'd never been to church before. Any church. Any church. They were there for drinking and carousing. That's why they came to Pensacola. And they got in line. And you know the Spirit of God, the peace of God came over them. And they stood there for hours and went in and got saved. How does that happen? Think about it for a minute. Day after day, year after year. You see... They traced it back and they said the revival started on Father's Day, I think it was uh, 1995, June 18th, and Steve Hill, an evangelist who, by the way, visited Pulaski years ago. He took a group from the Assembly of God Church way, way back then to Russia on a mission trip. 
Um, he wasn't any, Steve Hill wasn't special. He was just an evangelist. It was the power of God that had touched him. He'd gone to a couple meetings and had hands laid on him, and he came in on fire. Okay? The church was the dullest bunch of people I'd ever seen in my life. He gave the altar call. It must have went on for 20 minutes. He had one old guy with a walker, a cane, that came forward. He couldn't get anybody to even come forward. And all of a sudden, it started to break a little more, break a little more. The altars filled out. Then he started praying for people. They started going down the spirit. And things started happening. You see, revival starts in the hearts of the saved and then overflows. Um, and what happened at the Brownsville Assembly of God is before the revival started, they had a group of intercessory uh, intercessory prayer group that was taking place. Now, intercessory prayer is not like just a normal prayer meeting. Anybody ever really been involved? Intercessory prayer is completely different. Intercessory prayer is when all of a sudden you grab a hold of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit starts to moan and cry and howl with, with agony for lost souls, for the lost. Because that's the heart of God. If you grab a, get a hold of the heart of God and really get a concept of how badly God hurts and cries for the souls of His children, it will bring you to your knees. You will fall down in a puddle of your own tears. Revival happens when the church wakes up from its slumber. And starts looking up, and the power of God starts coming down. Colossians three one through four. And then you were, if you were then raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then also. With him, then you also will appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. What does that mean? It means you've got to start looking up. The more the church looks up, the more the power of God starts coming down. And if we keep looking up, something marvelous happens. What happens? It happens. Just like it did at the Brownsville Assembly of God. Just like I think it did in Toronto. Just like it has at the great cornfield revival. I don't even remember where that was. It's out in the middle of a cornfield. Was that Iowa or someplace? I can't remember where that one was at. Or Nebraska or something. Big revival that takes place. But what happens when we start looking up. When all of a sudden we start shifting our focus to God's heart. And His <coughs> desires. And start interceding for the lost. Something takes place, okay? That's right. A big hole gets blown in the heavenlies. You see, there was something different about Brownsville, something different about the property around the church that extended out. You had all that intercessory prayer going on, all that spiritual warfare against things in the heavenlies we're going to talk about. When you got onto the Brownsville Assembly of God, you could feel the Holy Spirit, but here's what you didn't feel. There was something missing, and that was the devil and all of his demons Hallelujah. in the air. They were not there. There was a hole blown in the heavenlies by prayer. And folks, it has to be kept open by prayer. But it was blown in the heavenly so that if somebody got dropped off from a cab driver, thought they were going to a, a, a real wild club someplace and it was a church, they would still stand in line and didn't know why they were there because God was moving in their life. Hallelujah. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. It says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood against people. It says, but against 
principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Oh, Folks, yeah. all those powers, all those principalities, all those, those rulers of the darkness and spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, none of those are flesh and blood. None of those are people. They're all spiritual things that we're wrestling against. And it's not the angels of God. It's the hosts of hell, folks. And I'm going to tell you how that works. You see, when we as a church remember who we are and what the Lord has done for us and start looking up, setting our mind on things above, then the power of God comes down. And as the power of God comes down, it blows a hole in the heavenlies over our head. I was, after I was first saved, I went to a little revival in high school. It was in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And uh, my former employer actually paid to have it put on. They had a lot of people. It was in the gymnasium. It was filled and there were seats and so forth. And uh, they had singers and preachers and stuff. One of the preachers was really struggling. He wasn't breaking through. There was an impression in there. Bad impression in the school. And then one of the one of the elders from one of the churches came and told him, he said, out in the foyer of the school, we got some woman in a long robe who's out there. We think she's a witch. And she's speaking curses on you, on the meeting, against the name of Jesus. Well, a bunch of the Saints of God got together someplace and they started praying and out the door she went. She couldn't stay there. Hallelujah. She had to go. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Amen. And it wasn't so much her in the flesh. They weren't warned against her. I don't think they even talked to her. It was those spiritual forces in the heavenly places. And all of a sudden in the meeting... The whole atmosphere turned around and people were being touched. The Spirit of God started moving. The oppression was gone. Principalities, powers, rulers of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places get blown out or torn down when the church starts looking up. Amen? And setting our minds on heavenly things. Intercessory prayer at Brownsville started. I think they did it on, I don't know, it was a Sunday night or something. And it went on for almost a year before they saw any results. But they blew a hole in the heavenlies and that revival continued for years as the prayer continued. I think the only thing that really changed and some of the people left is there got to be friction between the leadership. Satan got in and brought division where there had been unity. And that's the way that he clouds up the heavens again. Two or more on earth is agreed of touching anything. What does it say? It will be done, folks. Now, 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. Keeping in mind what I just shared, said if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Those whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, least the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. What stops the sunshine? How about a real cloudy, overcast day? Amen? Yeah? What stops the sunshine when you put a blanket over you? When there's a roof over your head? We need to understand the scripture. It says the gospel is veiled. How is it veiled? Everybody know what a veil is? I think of a veil as like in a, in a wedding. Doesn't the bride sometimes have a veil? What happens before she's married? The veil's lifted, right? Otherwise, they forget to do that. You say you may kiss the bride. It's a problem. There's a veil in the way. Got to learn these things if you do weddings. Amen. But it's veiled. It means it's covered. It means you can't see it. It says, if our gospel is veiled, <clears throat> it's veiled to those who are what? Who are perishing. 
People that don't know the Lord are perishing and the gospel is veiled. Why? It says, because the God of this age, who's the God of this age? Notice it's a little G. Satan. That's Satan. He's a wannabe God. His big line is, you shall be as gods. Folks, we're not gods. We're created beings and so is the devil. Amen? Amen. That's right. The only uncreated being in the universe is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yep. It says if it's veiled, it means it's obscured from view. The gospel will shine down. At Brownsville Assembly of God, before the revival took place in the hearts of the believers, before they started looking up, before the heavens were blown open, the gospel was veiled, folks. It was covered. My goodness, I looked at that crowd that Steve Hill was preaching, and it was good preaching, and they were about as excited as, as people who had been embalmed and sat there dead. They, did, they were like, I don't know what, the frozen chosen. They didn't even move. They didn't smile. They didn't give amens. They didn't do anything. They just sat like that. But something broke free that day. Hallelujah. You see, the gospel started to pour down. The whole kingdom of our enemy, those powers and principalities, those rulers of darkness, in high places, his whole kingdom is based on sin and darkness. The devil wants to keep the church's focus down on the ground and on the things in the world around us. The devil does not want you to be looking up and to set your mind on things above. Folks, if you've got problems down here in your life, the answer is not down here when you're looking at your problems. The answer comes, our help comes from on high. Amen? Our help is in the Lord's. 121st Psalm. Hallelujah. When you start looking up, God's power comes down. The devil wants us to forget what the Lord has done in our lives. We start out saying, look what the Lord has done. And then all of a sudden, we don't even remember what the Lord has done. The answer is in Ephesians 6, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of the same, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but we do wrestle with, folks. We're supposed to be wrestling with what? Principalities and powers. Rulers of darkness. Spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's where our battle is supposed to be focused. And you've got to be looking up to see that battle. We're wrestling with things we can't see with our natural eyes. You know, I wish people could see it. If God would open our spiritual eyes and you looked up into heaven, you would see over certain areas the demonic oppression. Did you know that Oswego County Social Services maps it out? They have maps. It was quite a few years ago I went to a meeting. I was one of the pastors there. They had pastors and teachers and a whole bunch of people. And they had a map. It was Oswego County. They had a map. And you could see. They trace up the map and they hit the railroad. I'm not going to tell you where it was. They hit the railroad tracks and go into this area. And you know what the lady called it? And they weren't, by the way, born again Christians. They didn't talk about sin. They talked about norms. Okay? She said... This area right here, you cross this line, we call this the land of the doomed. And all, they all laughed. The land of the doomed. It has the highest incidence of drugs, people being convicted of felonies, child abuse, incest, all kinds of sin and depravity, and, and, and the highest instance of poverty, Assaults, everything. You go into, it's a black area. As a matter of fact, it was, there was a set of railroad tracks. On one side was black and the other side was white. It started right there. They could, you could map it out. 
He could see it. It wasn't something that we, you know, oh, the church made this out. Church had nothing to do with this. This was demographics from social services. They keep track of all that stuff. And I'm looking at it and saying to myself, that's the devil. That makes no sense why there'd be a line here on one side of the line. You know, what's the difference in the center railroad track funding? But there was a geographic boundary there, and in that boundary that was cut off by some, some lines and some natural things, they could draw it right in there. It was called the land of the doomed. Let me tell you what, if people could have their spiritual eyes open, they would see powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. And what they would also see in that area, that there was nobody, nobody wrestling with those things. That's right. There were no big evangelical churches or, or churches that believed in the, the power of God and, and tearing down strongholds. I don't know what was missing in that area, but it had to be some churches that were doing something. Because you moved up across that line, you had some churches that believed in stuff, and it was different. It was different. It was completely different. Bless you. The land of the doomed. Folks, this whole world, as we travel through, there are areas that have darkness, and right next to them you have areas where it's not so dark, it's a little lighter. Why? Because... The sins that take place here on the ground give legal authority to the devil in the air. That's right. And the only way that you can deal, social services didn't know this. They're trying, they're working hard. They're wrestling with flesh and blood. They're trying. They're doing everything they can. They don't have a chance. Because it's not the battle on the ground, it's the battle in the air that's going to make the difference. That's right. The good news is that our victory in Christ is complete. All we have to do is change our focus and walk in it. As I quoted, 1 John 4, 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Notice it says, it doesn't say you will overcome them. It says you have overcome them. How have we overcome them? Not by our works, but by the finished, perfect, complete works of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. on the cross. When He said it was finished, it was finished, folks. Hallelujah. You know, I think the church in the latter days is becoming so earthly minded that it's no heavenly good. I think there's an old saying like that. Being so earthly minded don't be so earthly minded that you're no heavenly good. The battle is in the air over our heads. We have the invincible authority in Christ, in Jesus' name, if we just look up and start speaking that authority in the heavenly realms. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Colossians 1.13 says, He's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. What does that mean? It means that even though we're living in the world, we don't belong to the world. We're part of the kingdom of God. Amen. And we don't have to be here wrestling with flesh and blood. Our battle, our wrestling, is with powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. Hallelujah. Luke 10.19 says, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy. And nothing shall any means hurt you. You know, that scripture has some special significance for me. I don't know if I should share that. There's not a lot here today, so I'm going to go ahead and share it. God gave me a scripture, and he said, you need to memorize this scripture. And I read it over and over and over again. I kept reading it. I kept reciting it. Didn't know why God wanted me to know. Well, it was a short time after that in a prayer service, not in this church, had a lady come forward for deliverance. She wanted deliverance, she said, because she wanted to stop smoking. That was the deliverance. And she says, don't tell the senior pastor. 
And I wasn't a senior pastor. I was an associate pastor. Said, Don't tell him. Just pray for me. Don't tell him. Well, I didn't think that was right, so I just called call him over. And we started praying, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Do not let her fall down in the Spirit. Hold her up. Okay? How many know when people are out on their feet, they get happy? And I'm here, I got my feet locked and my knees braced and I'm holding on. And God saying, don't let her fall down. And we're praying and we're praying. And she's having hands laid. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit says, don't let her fall down. Don't let her fall down. I said, okay, okay, I won't let her fall down. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I started to hear some growling sounds. Some hissing sounds. Robin was there. There was a hundred people there. So if I was hallucinated, they all caught it. And I saw the most dramatic deliverance I've ever seen in my life. It was something out of a book, out of a, out of a movie. Out of a movie. Was it scary? Yeah, it was. It was one of the first ones I really experienced like that. That was a long time ago. Now it's nothing. But that, was, that was dramatic because all of a sudden, she went down finally. I couldn't even hang on to her anymore. And I heard hissing and snarling, and her tongue came out of her head so far that it touched the top of her head. Not possible, but I saw it. Her, her head swelled up like a basketball. People are running out the sanctuary doors of the church to get out of there. I can't run. I've got them praying for her here. You know, where am I going to go? And you know, the Lord had prepared me because He said, Memorize this scripture. Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you or harm you. I'm quoting that scripture. Not to her. To me. <laughs> I'm praying for her. Quoting, quoting, quoting. She's trying to claw me. Her hands are... And she's not even able to press the skin. It was like the most amazing thing. And she... She got delivered. It had nothing to do with smoking. It was, a, it was a demonic thing. It had been there her whole life. And she knew it, and it was gone. Folks, the lady was not an unsaved person. She was saved. She was a born-again Christian. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Spoke in tongues. Yeah. That was an interesting thing, because the pastor had just finished saying how Christians can't be a that's by demons. Christian can't have a demon. Well, he got proved otherwise there. I think God wanted to show him. Because I had argued about it and did a whole sermon on it one time. But I'll tell you what. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And that demonic thing that was cast out, folks, for everything that's on the ground here, there's a power and principality in the air that's up there. The same spirit. There's a hierarchy and folks, if you want to deal with the stuff on the ground, you first knock out the things in the air. Amen? When our Air Force goes someplace, and I'm going to close here in just a second. When our Air Force goes into battle, when our troops go into battle, you know the first thing they do? They knock out the command and control. They knock it out. So that all of a sudden the enemy has no, nothing and what's going on in the air? They knock out the battle in the air. They take out the Air Force. They take out all the control things. And then it's, the battle is won, folks. When you knock out the things in the air, the battle is won on the ground. Hallelujah. We have authority in Jesus' name. We can trample on devils, devils and demons and bind them up. And the Bible says in Matthew 18, 18, Surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Folks, we can't forget who we are in Christ and what the Lord has done in our lives. And you know, this area that we're in right now has some real powers and principalities in the air. That's right. We got, we got mothers with kids who are OD and on drugs. There was one that went out in the woods and OD. Right here, someplace. There's a couple of them. There are people dying. The drug epidemic is killing people. And you know, kids didn't know the mother. Mother did. It was just yeah. a young man up north that died this weekend from an OB. 
It's a, it's a sad, it's a sad situation. But you know what? Wrestling with flesh and blood on the ground isn't going to do it. We've got to come against the powers and principalities in the air. And you know, a church can do that. It takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of spiritual warfare. I felt it done once. Everything blown out. A big battle. The angels of God came in as the saints of God called them forth and, and stood against demonic wickedness in high places, alcoholism, drug abuse, incest. They stood against all kinds of different things and it got blown out. And you walk in, it's not what you feel, it's what you don't feel. The heavens open. When there's a heaven open, folks, the power of God falls. Hallelujah. There's a, uh, in Seoul, South Korea, there's Prayer Mountain, Dr. Cho's church there. It's 24 hour day, seven day prayer. And folks, people go over there that have never preached a message. And they preached and people get saved. They preached it someplace else, nothing would happen. Why? There's an open heaven over their heads. The church needs to start looking up. Today everybody's looking down at their tablets. We need to start looking up. You're never going to beat the enemy on a video game. That's but right. you can defeat him when you look up and proclaim the name of Jesus. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. Amen. While we're standing, can we have somebody pass out to read you? Go ahead. Yeah. Come into reading too. Who wants to do the second one? Go ahead. Yeah. Now when the power of God starts moving, let me share one real quick story. This is, a, this is a true story. God starts to touch those that, that aren't saved. I was in a morning prayer meeting. Not here, someplace else. And we were praying. And there was a few of us in the church and all of a sudden we heard a car come over the hill and into the parking lot, which at the time was gravel. I'm thinking, what is this? You know, we're not expecting anybody. We heard the door open and kind of slam, and somebody came into the sanctuary holding their chest like this, grabbing their chest. It was a man, and he's, he's staggering up the aisle to the altar, you know? And I'm thinking, wow, is he having a heart attack? What would you think? Think he's having a heart attack? Think he's having a wasn't he having a heart attack? You know what happened? He said, I was driving by. He said, I didn't even turn in here. Something grabbed the steering wheel. My car turned the corner, went over the hill and into this parking lot. I, my chest is hurting. I've got pains in my chest. I'm thinking, well, if you just came in here on your own because you had chest pain, then evidently. You're probably having a heart attack. But you know, if the power of God turns somebody's steering wheel into a place they had never been before, he didn't live there. He wasn't from the town. He didn't even know there was a church down there. Okay? He comes staggering in. So immediately, because it was pretty obvious, I just laid hands on him in the name of Jesus. I bound that thing and cast him out. Guess what? The chest pain went. He got saved. He got set free. Hallelujah. How does something like that happen? I don't know. All I can think of is a big angel sat in his lap and turned the steering wheel. Stuff like that happens. It happens. Hallelujah. Let's just pray with me. Say, Father God, I know that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord is saved. And right now, I call upon your name. I repent of all my sins. Wash them away with your blood. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now I'd like you to pray another prayer with me.
Just, just pray and say, Father God, Father God I, know I, don't wrestle I know I don't wrestle with flesh and blood, flesh and blood. but with principalities, but with, with powers, with, with rulers of the darkness, Against spiritual hosts and wickedness. Against spiritual hosts and wickedness. In heavenly places. In heavenly places. Lord, today I want to look up. Lord, today I want to look up. And see your glory. And see your glory. And when I look up, Lord. And when I look up, Lord. Let your power come down. Let your power come down. Let the heavens be open over our heads. Let the light of the gospel shine to those who have been blinded by the devil. That they would see the light of your gospel and glorify my Father, which is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. That same night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. When he broke it, he said, Take and eat, for this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Thank you. And after the same manner, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take and drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you right now and praise you, Father God. The greater is he that's in us and he that's in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.